our good friend, Kelly Bunny. Good morning. I don't know who Steve was talking about, but yeah, he said he didn't know me, and that's fine. Um, three weeks ago, we were given a message about Moses, the burning bush, and his staff. We were told to throw down whatever we have and allow God to use it to encourage and lead others. That morning, Zach confronted the lamb's table. It either were lambs or were sheep that were stupid and need to be led. Um, because we're wiser and older, uh, that we should bring a message or testimony to encourage each man in your walk with God. Amen. Some of you from the Lambs Fellowship know me. Some of you may know me from here. No men left behind. And Lewis is not here, but it's, no, it's e, men with an E, okay? Um, but rarely do we know the journey others get to take to this point in our lives. So here's a bit of my background. My life started in Colorado, the northwestern corner on a ranch. If you know about Steamboat Springs, it's 51 miles west of, of Steamboat Springs. My mother was a daughter of a Baptist minister, and she and my younger sister were taken to church by her at every chance she got. Uh, my father, who was struggling to be a Christian, husband and father, along with running a ranch, it's a full-time job. The animals need to be fed, cared for, the chickens have to have their get eggs gathered every day. Cows need to be milked twice a day. Plus there's the planting of the wheat and barley, the period in the summer when it's time for haying. Long story short, far ranching, farming is a 24-7 job. No paid vacations, no family leave, just an amazing and very fulfilling <clears throat> way of life. My dad was a good father, but the requirements of the ranch he didn't have much time for God. Mom was a great role model for trusting in the Lord, even in the most difficult of times. My parents moved to Scottsdale in 1965 because of health issues for my dad and disagreements with his father and his younger brother about how to operate the ranch. Five, year, five years later, my parents divorced and were separated and they went their separate ways. But through this all, I knew that they loved my sister and me. Moving forward a few years, I went to college, earned a degree in landscape architecture. I moved to Southern California in 1977 and worked for a landscape architect contractor in the South Bay area. My sister was there also in West LA and she su suggested that we go to the ranch for Christmas and that would be 1978. Sounded like a good idea because my grandparents and other family members were still there. And a couple days before Christmas, I had finished skiing and I walk into the Sheraton bar there in, at the slopes and here's this good looking hot babe <laughs> and we start talking. Um, she had been skiing all day and later on that afternoon, that evening, my, my uh, family interrupt my flirtations and say it's time to go back to the ranch. I leave, young lady, didn't uh, share phone numbers or anything. I just went home. Uh, the day after Christmas, I went back to Steamboat Springs to go skiing and to look for this lady in a yellow ski suit. I found her and we skied the rest of the day. And I asked her if she would be, if she would like to go back to the ranch with me and have a venison dinner. It would have been our last dinner. And crazily enough, she said yes. 
So we drive the 51 miles. I didn't call my family. We didn't have cell phones at that time. And I could have gone on to the landline and, and you know, pay phone. Some of you younger guys may not know what a pay phone is, and that's okay. Um, but I, I knew it would be not be a problem. It was okay with my, my grandparents especially that I bring this lady to the ranch. And yes, she was crazy. Vicki, my wife, the lady I was gonna meet, or I met. We drove the rest of the 51 miles to the, meet my family, and at this time, I already done all that. Um, she w was from Kansas City. She was divorced and had a seven-year-old son. Um, a long-distance relationship followed, and that summer, June of 1979, she moved out to Southern California to live with me. Uh, and then in August of that year, we went back up to the ranch and got married on the, um, the homestead where my great-grandparents were homesteaded. And here I am, suddenly, I'm a husband. That's great, I've never been a husband before, so that's okay. But I'm also a father to a seven-year-old son. You know, how do you do with, deal with this? Four years later, Vicki and I had a daughter by C-section. And the doctor told me to go with the nurse and bond with my daughter because he had to deal with my wife. And during that time, I was confronted by God. Here was this little miracle sleeping in my arms. And I knew that I needed to make some major changes in my life. At this point, we had moved out to this area because we could afford housing, and I had started my own landscape construction business. Vicki was in special ed, so she was able to get a job in Lake Elsinore. We found a church and grew in the Lord. Was I a good father? A good husband? A good employer? Sometimes. Not always. You may be asking yourselves, these questions, you may be doubting your own abilities to cope with all that is thrown at you. It's a tough, but when you are, or it's tough, but when you are faced with anger or frustration, we need to ask ourselves, what would Jesus do? This is the really tough part, I'm sorry. In 2009, She was diagnosed with colon cancer. Little did we know that this was going to be our burning bush. For the next nine years, we prayed, struggled, cried, and were blessed. blessed with my two youngest granddaughters. On the, on the 29th of August last year, God healed Vicki. But in doing so, he took her home to heaven. During the last 10 years, God has been preparing me for His purpose. Just as Moses was in the desert for 40 years until God called him to lead his people out of bondage, I believe that God has called me. I'm not too sure why, but He's God and I'm not. In Exodus, chapter 14, verses 13 and 14, we see that Moses' identity has changed. He tells the people, do not be afraid, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Just as Noah was, was told to build the ark, 
because it was going to rain for 40 days. By the way, they had no idea what rain was. If you read the account of Noah in Genesis chapter 5, 6, and 7, you will notice that God was pleased with him. Noah didn't question God, just went to his family with the blueprints God had provided, picked up his chainsaw, skill saw, <coughs> hammer, and his three sons, and went to work. In the book of Esther, we're told that Haman was, has convinced the king to destroy the, view, the Jews. Mordecai tells Esther about the plot and that, he, that she needs to go to the king and disclose this to King Xerxes. She's afraid, yet Mordecai tells her in chapter 4, verses 13 and 14, do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at, another, silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. Could I get a napkin? There's one. Oh, thank you, Bob. Yep. In John, the last chapter, when Jesus is about to reinstate Peter, we read, and this is my paraphrase, Peter, do you love me more than these? If so, feed and tend my sheep. Then Jesus tells Peter to follow me. And Peter turns and looks at John and asks, well, what about him? And Jesus tells Peter, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You follow me. I believe that Paul, the author of most of the New Testament, was one of the, most, one of the Pharisees that hassled Jesus during his lifetime. Then after his conversion, he spent three years on the backside of the desert, being taught by Jesus, being broken by Jesus, and being rebuilt by Jesus. He had to throw down his staff. Three years later, he picks it up and goes to work. Each of these individuals were told to do something by God, the Holy Spirit, or Jesus. Each of them did as they were instructed. There are many examples of God telling men and women what to do. Those with strong faith and love of God did as they were told. For us today, it seems harder to really know when God is speaking to us. We are not face to face as Peter was with Jesus. Just as Moses told his people, you need only to be still, we can hear God's voice, the Holy Spirit, and hear him working in our lives. We just need to listen. Ask yourself, what would Jesus do? Nine months ago, the bottom dropped out of my life. Now I think I know where God is leading me. Vicki and I had a home Bible study, care group, and I've started that back up again. And our first study was dealing with listening to the Holy Spirit. And in the quiet moments when I have been still, I have been learning to listen. I believe that he is out there and wanting men to pick up their stabs and get on board. I doubt that, <coughs> I doubt that any of you have heard of the amazing Rhythm Mazes. It was a southern country rock band from the 70s and 80s. And they have one song that stands out to me. It's called The Spirit Walk. And the first verse says, when the spirit moves, there's no telling where it's going. Because it don't ask you if you approve of what it's doing. And your future is out of your hands. So when you feel the spirit walk and you hear it talk, you better be ready to change your plans. You may be asking yourselves, what have I got that God can use? I need to get my life in order, study more. My life is a mess. My job makes me crazy. My wife wants another child. Let me give you a little bit more history of me four months ago. In the process of studying the Holy Spirit, I found that I was listening more 
And one evening, I distinctly heard him say, stop drinking vodka. That was my drink of choice. And during the time I was Vicky's care provider, I was careful not to drink too much. But when she passed, there was no reason for me not to drink as much as I wanted. And I did. Then back to that evening, the Holy Spirit says, I want you to stop drinking vodka. Feeling that this is from the Holy Spirit and would be a good thing for me, my family, my care group, I agreed. And this could have been on a Friday afternoon, Friday evening. The following Sunday, a good friend of mine and his wife took me to lunch and I explained to them what I was doing. And they, they thought it was a good thing and it was also a God thing. They prayed for me and they said that they would continue praying for me. That Monday, after, or Monday evening I was putting out the trash cans and I felt the Holy Spirit come to me and say, are you man enough to follow me? And I knew what, it's, what he was talking about. Because in my garage, I have a refrigerator. And in that refrigerator was a new bottle of vodka. I went there, took the vodka, vodka out, poured it away, or poured it in the trash, and then took the can out, to the, or to the bottle out to the trash cans. So for the past three months, I've been vodka free. I didn't hear, I didn't hear the Holy Spirit, thank you, thank you. I didn't hear, hear the Holy Spirit say anything about wine and beer and other hard liquor do, doesn't entice me. And so it's, it still hasn't bothered me. And then May 2nd comes along. Vicki and I have a, her, her friend that she was with in, in Steamboat lives in, in Kansas City. And I went out to see she and her husband, and it's all right. And I get to Kansas City on the on the second of May. Go into the hotel that my wife and I had stayed at for a number of times because our friends have a small house. It's a close to their their place. I walk in, and the bottom falls out again. I go immediately up to my room, grab my phone, go online, and find the nearest liquor store. And I go there and buy some wine for our friends, some, some tonic water, some bitters, and some vodka. There you have it. I fell on my face. I failed. I'm broken. What could God do with a failure like me? I'm not worthy of his love and forgiveness, but yet I prayed and asked him for, to forgive me, and I believe he has. I believe he has. And yesterday morning, I felt the Holy Spirit, actually the night before that, as I'm working on this thing, I felt the Holy Spirit say, are you man enough? So yesterday morning, I'm putting out trash cans, and away goes that bottle of vodka. Again. Let me share one last thing. I'm not too sure who says, said this, but I, it makes sense to me. God can use broken crayons to create a masterpiece. I challenge each of you to get in touch with the Holy Spirit and let Him start a masterpiece. He created the universe in six days. Give him your life and watch what he can do. Remember what Moses told the Israelites? To stand still. We need to be still and listen to the Holy Spirit and then pick up our steps or whatever God has blessed you with and get busy. If any of you feel like the bottom is about to drop out or has dropped out of your life, don't, don't go through it alone. Find somebody to talk to. If your wife has cancer, call me. I've walked in your shoes. I may not have all the answers, but I have ears 
and I will listen. And I will pray for you. Thank you. God bless each of you.